When I was an associate pastor at Meredith Drive Reformed Church, there was a ministry to African immigrants in the Des Moines area. And that was a wedding reception that I got to partake in. I don't know if you saw it really well. It was on my phone. I didn't have a great phone, but it was interesting, the energy and the excitement of a different culture. And people were excited to be there, and I learned a great deal. And the church tried to assimilate some of our, we call African friends, into the congregation. And it was a little trying. It was difficult because of just cultural differences that we had. And yet there were so many people with goodwill, and we tried to work together to to minister in that community, and it was beautiful. Unfortunately, there was a lot of folks, obviously African immigrants to this nation, didn't have a lot of resources, didn't have a lot of money. And so there are many times where we would help people, and it was, it was a beautiful thing that was being created. Also, at the same church, there were folks that were very well-to-do. A lot of resources. Successful business owners, l- lawyers, people who had a great means, uh, even know of a staff member where they redid their church basement. That people just got money together and redid the church basement for a staff member at the church. I mean, a lot of money. Now, we may not have the cultural diversity that was taking place that you saw there in our congregation, but there are differences of opinion in this room. There are differences in age in this room. There are differences in what people like musically in this room. Differences. How do we love one another in our differences? We continue in our series today in the book of James of faith that works. As we go through this book, we're going to read today that James is writing to the church that he says there should be no favoritism in the church. There should be no favoring one person over another. And he talks specifically about resources, money in this passage. But we are encouraged today to think about how do we treat one another in the body of Christ? He also, after talking about the unity in the body of Christ, He talks about how we are to imitate Christ. And so as we turn to God's word this day, let's pray. Father, thank you for the diversity in this room of thought, of age, of ideas. But Father, we pray through it all that we are united in you. That because of what Christ has done on the cross, we can submit in our pride, we can submit in our thoughts and our decisions to do what is best for your church. So Holy Spirit, teach us today as we read your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you, there are Bibles uh, in the seats before you. If you'd pull that out, the Bible, and uh, turn to James 2. If you're unfamiliar where James is at, it's way towards the end of Scripture. Uh, It'd probably be best to start at the end and then turn back that way. Last week, we talked about chapter 1, that we are to consider it all joy during trials. Did we practice that this week? Anybody go through a trial and you're like, oh, I consider it pure joy today, right? It's difficult to do, but James encourages us, consider it pure joy when we go through trials. James was talking to a group of people when he first wrote this of persecuted Christians, people who were being persecuted physically for their faith. They were also suffering in the fact that there was a famine going on during that time. So as the leader of Jerusalem, he was trying to encourage people's hearts and minds. And now he turns more to the body itself, the body of believers. How are they to treat one another? He's saying they must have an active faith and that they are not to show partiality to one person or another and that we are to imitate Christ. So as we look in James 2, with that as a little bit of the background, I'll be reading verses 1 through 13 first. My brothers and sisters, believers in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor next by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? 
Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom of, that promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law and lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do not commit murder, but do commit murder, have you become a lawbreaker? Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We're going to stop right there. Please leave your Bibles out, and we'll finish the chapter in a little bit. But I want to focus on how we treat one another. Favoritism. When I was a fourth grade teacher years ago, um, it was hard not to have favorites. It was hard not to have students that you just really liked, right? Because they listened. They followed directions. They would help me out. They would be encouraging to other students. It was hard not to show favoritism because of just the way in which they acted in the classroom. I can remember Shane. I can remember Eric. I can remember Chantel and Chelsea. That's a pretty good memory. That was a long time ago. But I remember them. Why? Because they made an impact. Because they were really good kids, and it was really hard not to sit there and go, oh, boy, I really like them better than them. Favoritism. You see, James speaks in this chapter in a way in which we live is the evidence of our faith. If we do not display peace and patience and kindness and gentleness to others, or the fruit of the Spirit... Are we displaying true faith? And James talks specifically here about favoritism in the body of believers, especially how the poor are treated. Now, friends, it's easy to love those that we get along with or those that are the same economic, socioeconomic status than us. The real test is how we love those who are vulnerable in our world, unable to have a voice. How do we treat those who don't have a voice like we do? How do we love those who can't give us a leg up in the world? You see, in the context of James, there was such a disparity of wealth. 8% were really wealthy at that time in the Roman Empire. 2% had a chance to be wealthy. 90% is what we would say are poor. The pyramid was steep. The division was great. James is saying to those in the church, treat each other with equity, not catering to others because of their wealth, but loving the way in which God loves. Do we try to impress other people in the world, or do we love the way in which Jesus loves, not worrying about status in society? One scholar wrote this, he says, we do well to remember that James wrote to a very partial age in which he was writing to, filled with prejudice and hatred based on class and ethnicity and nationality and religious backgrounds. People were permanently categorized into a spot. But we see that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, rich or poor, Greek or barbarian or whatever. In Christ they were one. You see, this sort of unity shown was an astonishment to the Greek world. They were used to this caste system in which people would live and be pigeonholed in. But the church was different. The church behaved different. And this command by James, what he is saying here to the apostles in the early church, is to teach, is to say, to have faith in the Lord Jesus means you treat people equally. You see, being impartial to how we treat others is a proof of our faith. Now, we might not think so much about class of money, wealth, whatever it may be, 
but simply how do we treat one another when they are different than us or have different political views than us? That seems to be the issue of our day, right? How do we love well when we disagree? When speaking of wealth, scholar R.C. Sproul says this. He says, all of this is not to say that having wealth itself is bad. Obviously not. There are many people in Scripture, Abraham, Job, King David, that had great wealth. Several people worked for the good of the cause, just as today many people with wealth help ministries grow and flourish and spread the good word because of money. But the problem is how we look at it. And how do we treat people in the process? You see, when we read James 2, 1 through 4, the church is not to show favoritism. They're not to be highly esteemed because of their money, and consequently, the poor are not to be shown less respect simply because of a lack of wealth. A way to have favoritism, to lose that sense of favoritism, is to be generous. Generosity in ways that can be given to others or to be thought of for others or deeds or actions given to others, to be generous with our lives is the fruit of the Spirit. You know, it's amazing. Each, each week at church, there's just some things that just kind of grab my attention. And this past week, we had two families, a family and an individual, come in to the church and say, we want to help with this project. So they send a check, and they say they want to help. Um, you know, Andy Baker was here a few weeks ago, or, yeah, two weeks ago, and he's a missionary that we support in Nicaragua, and they're doing a medical mission there, and they needed some resources. And this person came in, and they just decided to give money. And we said, could we use that for that? Yes. So that, that medical mission is funded by one family. Then another person comes in and they say, you know what, I just have this money, I want to give it to the church uh, to help somebody with rent or whatever. It's just exciting to see generosity, begotting generosity, generosity, living and loving and serving. It's a beautiful thing. Evidence of the Spirit at work in our church and in people's lives. But generosity isn't just through money. It's through the way in which we think about others and include other people and love others when they are different than us. We see in these verses today, and James is saying it is natural for us to be selfish. It's natural for us to esteem other people. But friends, God does not judge on social status or appearance. God evaluates us in our hearts. Many verses. Second Chronicles 19.7 says, With the Lord our God, there is no injustice or partiality. And the word partiality means favoritism here, not to treat people differently. The prophet Samuel was told when he was looking for someone God could use, he said, people judge by outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. They ended up choosing David, who was the youngest in the eyes of others. He was the youngest and he wasn't the most popular in the eyes of his brothers. Deuteronomy 10, 17 says, The Lord your God is a God, the God, the Lord of lords, the great and mighty God. He is awesome, and he shows no partiality. You see, friends, God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't play favorites, and neither should we, no matter what that difference might be. One scholar wrote that favoritism means to lift someone's face up, to lift a face up is to show favoritism. And the idea is to judge someone and take them at face value, a superficial evaluation of a person's worth based on nothing but what appears on the outside, the surface. And James is saying here that showing favoritism is absolutely incompatible with being a Christian. Amen? Absolutely incompatible with being a Christian to show favoritism to others. Look with me, friends, in verse 14. If you have your Bibles out, James 2, 14. Now he turns to a very practical teaching, one that should equip and inspire us all. In verse 14, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? 
Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith and my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see, that person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now, the context in which James is writing here, he's saying that uh, there's those who were converted from, from Jewish to Christianity, they were Jewish Christians now, and when they discovered this new salvation by faith alone, it wasn't by their works or upholding the law, they had this newfound freedom, and they were like, hey, now we can just do whatever we want if it's just through faith. We can live the way we want to. If it is by grace alone, faith alone, then we don't need to do anything. And James says to them, no, we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, but saving faith will have works accompany it. The Apostle Paul understood the necessity of works in our lives when he wrote in Ephesians 2, for we are his workmanship, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are designed to participate in the world to use our gifts to serve others. A theme in James is a holistic life that we don't just think one way and be a certain other way, but that we are holistic, we're not fragmented, that what we believe we actually live. Writer Randy Alcorn stated this, he says, in about wealth, but also talking about what our priorities are. He said, suppose you buy shares in General Motors, What happens? You suddenly develop an interest in General Motors. You check the financial pages, you see a magazine article about GM and read it word for word. If you're interested in GM and you invest in GM, you want to know what's happening. He said, suppose you're giving to children with AIDS. You want to help them. When you see an article on the subject, you're hooked. If you spend money giving to them, you want to know what's going on. You watch the news. You hear about what's happening. Alcorn goes on to say, do you wish you cared more about eternal things? Then reallocate our time and our money about that to live out this faith that we have. Put your resources, your assets, your time, your money, possessions, energies into the things of God and watch what happens. As surely as the compass needle flows north, your heart will follow your treasure Money leads and the heart follows. Where we spend our time, where we write checks to, it's what we value. There are a tremendous amount, and I'm so grateful for our church, the generosity in this place, the number of people who serve, the number of people who give resources to support missions and ministries locally and around the world. But we are encouraged by James to continue that journey, to continue the journey of living out our faith daily. You know, what's hard is that there's so many needs in the world. Do you recognize that? you ever see it? I just see it sometimes. I'm overwhelmed by the number of needs I see locally and also globally. And I shared this a while back, but I think it's a great statement for each one of us today when thinking about living out our faith. 
And the quote is this, the greatest thing we can do for God is usually the thing at hand. What is it that God's showing you in your life where you could serve or be generous? Where is he showing me? I was so pumped this Friday. We got to talk to the coaches and the AD and FCA program at William Penn. I've been here in this church almost eight years now, and I've been dis- I'm always hoping some in into the college at William Penn. And now we have it. As a church, we can adopt a sports team. And we can go in and do character development sorts of things and, and give devotions to the teams. For eight years, just wondering, can we make a stronger connection with the college? And now the college is coming to the churches and saying, hey, we recognize that we need this. Can you be a part of it? And so now, with this opportunity, we can feed a bunch of students. We can talk about Jesus with a bunch of students that we weren't able to before. You see, the greatest thing we can do for God is usually the thing at hand. And that just seemed like, wow, what a wonderful moment. And they said, we are the, the college said they're so thankful that, ch- that churches will be involved now. Friends, what is presenting you in your life that you know that could help others in the church or a family member or a friend? What is right in front of us today that we could serve? Or who is on your mind a lot? Is there somebody that you just think about a lot that Maybe they could use some help in some way. And it doesn't have to be money. It could be time or energy. In the book of James, God is saying, do it. Just do it. It's important as we read the book of James, we ask ourselves some questions. And one is, Have we trusted in Christ and Christ alone for salvation? You see, James is not contradicting that. He is just saying that evidence of faith is works, are our works. Has there been a change in our life? Do we look at life differently? Are we focusing on serving others? Are we focusing on how we can be present with other people? Do we seek to grow in the things of the Lord? And then the other one is, how do we treat people that don't have a leg up in life? I want this to come off correctly because I didn't write it. I, I experienced it last night, so give me some grace if it comes out wrong. Are we okay with that? Okay. Last night, Shelly and I are at Culver's. I love Culver's. <laughs> love it. And as we were sitting there, my wife... She has such a heart for people that have special needs or um, something in their life is, is, is really difficult. She's a special ed teacher at the middle school for behavior. And we also, we adopted a child with extreme special needs because of her, how God working through her. And so we're at Culver's and I'm eating my fish sandwich. (laughs) delicious. And we're talking, and there was a man who was cleaning tables, and he looks at my wife, and he walks right over to her. Now, we can tell he has special needs, and he develops a conversation with us. And then he gives us a fist bump when he's done with our conversation. Have a good meal, fist bump. This bump. And that moment really struck me. First of all, just the heart of my wife. But I just wonder what God's doing in that moment when he was drawn to come over and talk to her. I don't want to get too crazy, but maybe it was the Spirit of God. Who's drawn to you? Who's drawn to you in your life? 
How is the Spirit working through you? And it doesn't matter what age you are. Are we embracing other people? Are we unified in faith? Or do we like to cause division? James is saying in this book today, treat everybody with dignity, no matter what they have or they don't have, or how they look or don't look, whatever. Treat them with dignity. For authentic faith acts upon this belief of Jesus that he loves us deeply. And therefore, we can spend our lives now and into eternity serving him. And we do this, friends, even in our imperfection. I hate to break the news, but each one of us is fragmented in some way. We carry around our goodness and we carry around our pain with us wherever we go. And God in his beauty still uses us. There's a story that I'd like to close with today. Talking about the unity in Christ. There's a certain wealthy man Summoned to build, summoned a building contractor and told him he wanted to enlist his services to build a home. This was to be no ordinary home. He says, I have the plans, the rich man said as he unrolled the blueprints. I know exactly what I want. And the contractor studied them in growing amazement. This just wasn't a house. This wasn't just a mansion. This was a palace. No expense was going to be spared to build this house. He had already laid the foundation with much deeper and stronger than the contractor would have thought possible or necessary for that matter. Great stones had been quarried and fit tightly together, drawn below, and there would be neither uh, slippage or settling. Nothing would ever undermine or shake this house. The foundation was strong. But when the rich man began to describe the materials he wanted the contractor to use, in his astonishment, it turned to bewilderment. There was no mention of marble or mahogany or rich tapestries or gold decoration. The incredibly wealthy man, who clearly wanted the best of everything, required that this house be built from bricks, mud, and straw. And the woodwork be drifted in salvaged lumber, that the carpets be woven rags, and the windows crafted from broken glass. Those bricks will crumble under that weight, the contractor protested. The wood would be impossible to work with. Every mantle and and tapestry will look cheap and it won't last. And those windows won't even let in enough light, but the rich man wouldn't hear it. He explained how he planned for the mud brick walls to be several courses deep to hold the weight. And he showed the beautiful carvings he wanted worked from the wood and the rich patterns that he had in mind from these rags and the glorious stained glass windows he envisioned from the broken glass, not to let light in, but to turn light out. It says in Ephesians 2, 19, just build with the materials I give you, follow my plans, and my house will be like no other. Now, if there are no more questions, go, begin. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Build on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building has joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Friends, with Jesus Christ as the foundation of our lives, he takes imperfect people and he makes something beautiful. The church, with all its struggles and troubles, we declare that the master builder is doing a great work among us. He is changing hearts. He's changing minds. That we would love everyone well. That we would show no partiality. That we would use our resources of time, talent, and treasure to help others. To live in faith. Friends, this week, as we think about the book of James, as we go through it, May we live out our faith the way in which God designed you and in which he designed me. For the greatest thing we can do for God is usually the thing at hand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you encourage us through your spirit. Thank you that as a community of believers we can be united as one, 
amid our differences, that we live for a greater mission of proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray a blessing upon each person this day as they think about what you place in front of them and how we are to respond. God, help us not just to be hearers of your word, but doers of the word. But we can only do this through the help and guidance of your spirit. So, Father, we declare our dependency on you. We declare your goodness in our lives that you offer us salvation, life eternal. May we live a life out of gratitude for all that you have done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.